All right, and uh, welcome back to Northwestern Voices. I'm Zach Johnson, the host here, and today my guest is Mr. Paul Dove. And uh, Paul's a good friend of mine and someone who I consider to be an expert in all things related to music. And it's not just me who considers him that. Uh, as we were just talking, uh, Paul does, in fact, have a PhD in music. So uh, I think uh, the uh, title of expert is, uh, is well-deserved. Paul uh, graduated from Concordia College in Moorhead with a degree in English and philosophy. He, right. stayed, he stayed a fifth year and uh, obtained enough credits to get a teaching degree or teaching license in, uh, in music. After that, uh, he worked for a bit in Sisseton, South Dakota. South Dakota. We'll get to that in a little bit because that's where you met your wife, <laughs> Pat. Uh, and then went on to receive advanced degrees, including the PhD and, um, and, and another degree from Indiana University in Bloomington, the well-known music school there. So after that, uh, Paul held uh, various positions, but I think the, the, the place that you worked the longest was for about 30 years at the University of Evansville right. in southern Indiana right. and um, a professor of music there. But then in the year 2000, Paul retired. And <laughs> I'm laughing about that because, and I'm using air quotes, because uh, uh, from what I've seen, Paul did anything but retire. Uh, it, it almost seems as though Paul has lived a second life. Actually, they say that American lives always have a, a second act. And I think you've had, a, you've had quite a second act here uh, back in, in Park Rapids because in the year 2001, Paul founded at, or co-founded at least with his wife, Pat, and others, the Northern Light Opera Company, an organization of which I am currently the secretary. And do you, have do you know the origin of the name, <laughs> Northern Light Opera No, Company. I don't, actually. It was, when I was retiring, people were asking, what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be doing? And so I knew we would be coming back up to, to Minnesota because we had a summer cabin that we spent summers. And... I thought, okay, just to put them off, I, I just said, well, we'll start the Northern Light Opera Company, which to me was a pun. Is it the Northern Light Opera Company uh -huh. or is it the Northern Light Opera Company? Right. I mean, it, the Northern Lights Opera Company would no, be, yeah. Only one. Only one. <laughs> only one light. <laughs> so it's light opera. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, the, yeah, that's, you know, the whole, the whole idea of music theater uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, some other kinds of theater are called light opera, mm -hmm. you know, and light opera basically is a is a good piece of music that tells a story, and has has good music and has has good plot to it that keeps people involved. Well, as opposed to let's say heavy opera because uh I, there was that one time when i came over to your house a couple of years ago and we watched the entirety of parsifal which was i think six and a half or seven hours that, long. Was, that would not qualify no, as that, light opera. That, that's <laughs> that's uh <laughs> that's not light opera no. that's uh you know it's <laughs> yeah that's the opposite of light opera. right so paul um I, I, we're going to talk a lot about Northern Light Opera Company later, but I, I kind of wanted to start at the beginning here. Well, one of the things about the beginning is that I was at Concordia rather than at the University of Minnesota uh, because I thought I was being called into the ministry. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. I thought that was my call. Didn't I didn't really have that much interest in doing it, but I thought that was it. Where did you grow up? I, in southern Minnesota, southwest Minnesota, uh, Madison, Minnesota, which is right on, you know, very close to the South Dakota border. I, I know exactly where Madison, okay. Minnesota is because I happen to have a colleague who works here with me who uh, is uh, also hails from Madison. Who's that? Uh, th that's Matt Enger. Oh. Yeah. And he uh, he still plays baseball for the Madison Mallards, so I know where it is. I didn't. I had, well, I had any, no idea that you were from Madison. Anyway, in my okay. mm -hmm. in my senior year, 
I was taking an elective. I was in philosophy and English. Uh, because I chose those subjects because I thought those would be the kinds of courses that I need to do if I'm going into the ministry. Interesting. Okay. Well, my, what, what my made strength. You think, what made you think that the ministry might be for you? I have no idea. But okay. I think somebody, I think people said, oh, yes, he, he would make a good minister. You know, uh -huh. and, and I thought, okay, well, that's a calling. But it was a, I think it was a calling to go to Concordia. Okay, yeah. Because I went... And in my senior year, I knew I did not want to go to the seminary. I was having a kind of a uh, an issue with that. And then I was taking a conducting class just for the fun of it. It was an elective. Mm -hmm. And Paul J. Christensen, after about the second week, he said, why aren't you in music? And the quick question came to my mind, why wasn't I? That's right. Yeah. Well, what 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 background? I mean, well, when, I, when you started, what was your what was your first experience with either making music or oh, I, yeah, high school band, high school choir, mm -hmm. college? I sang in the in the in chapel choir. Enjoyed music. Did enjoyed you take singing. piano lessons when you were? Well, in? I had piano lessons when I was young, but mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of things, I wasn't good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was not. The, that was not a calling. Would you say though that's when you when you first started to learn to read music? Oh yeah, that's you know that, I had no problem in reading music and hearing the music. Do you remember your first piano teacher? Yes. Uh, well, who, I can't remember her name, but uh, I remember the. <laughs> what was that like? It was good. I mean, yeah. she she was very patient, and uh, you know all the times that that uh, she would put up with what I was playing and give encouragement, but. It was not, I was not really challenged or pushed. You know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't that good. So, but anyway, it was, it was, the piano was not my instrument. It Did was, you take it up another voice. instrument after that? No, I took, I, I played a trumpet. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And that it, it was good. When did but you when did you do that? Was that like? It was high school. In high school. Yeah, okay. that was high school. But then at Concordia, I was, I sang, um, but when when they asked the question, why aren't you in music? It dawned on me that that might be what I was there for. So I went, got into freshman theory my mm -hmm. senior year, oh. finished that freshman theory course, and then went back for another year at Concordia to finish up other courses that would re, that would give me uh, credentials to 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 teach. Mm -hmm. And that was the that was because it being in music and being in choral music and in vocal music, it's been a great life. Right, and so that is really kind of where you started to to, to shift your focus. Then was to be a conductor and to to be right. a choir director, right. essentially, right? Right, yeah. and a and a voice teacher and a voice teacher. Right. Do you sing yourself? I sing, uh huh, but not anymore. My voice is uh, kind of uh, it's kind of raspy and. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, I've, 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 being in Rotary with you, I know that you're often song lead. But uh, did you ever have any kind of uh, uh, career aspirations as a singer yourself, or anything of that nature? No, no, I didn't. No, I, it, and all of this came up uh, basically at 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 Evansville, you know, because I went there as a music ed voice teacher general music and and as I as I w moved through that process of staying at at Evansville uh, new opportunities came up okay but before you get to Evansville I I do want to talk about your experience in Sisseton oh Sisseton yeah, yeah Sisseton South Dakota yes what was that like and by the way what just for context what year are we talking about here? well 59 is when I graduated 60 was when I first had my first teaching job. Okay, so it's 1960. Right. And uh, is Kennedy president at this point? or Well, he was, I think he was elected, he started in 61, I believe. Okay. He was elected in 61. Okay, just just so we have a little background here. So now right. you're in Sisseton, South Dakota, and what are you doing over there? Well, I taught, I taught I, actually I taught English the first year. High and school. then in choirs and elementary music education, junior high music education, 
And so it was trying to trying to keep up to what was going on in the schools. And and, and and then and then you met someone there. I met Pat. She was she was singing in my church choir and uh, it was it was good. So did now we have to know, did you approach her or did she approach you? No, I approached her. She was <laughs> I think she I'm not sure about this, but I think she had she had a, was in a relationship some, with somebody else, but I don't know. Yeah. It's not, I'm not going to ask. Now you didn't, it, this, these weren't the days where you would get her cell phone number and start texting, right? Uh, no, no, we didn't, <laughs> no, we didn't do any texting. But so it was, so, it's a small enough, it, yeah. it was the church that we belonged to, mm-hmm. and it was, it was pretty quick. Okay. Met so, her in the fall, got engaged in January, which is pretty fast. Wow. And, see, and, and, yeah, see, that's, uh-huh. you know, that's before people had relationships without going into marriage. Sure, sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you you met her in the fall. You got uh, engaged in January, and then when when were you married? What June. Were, in June. June. What's yeah. your What's your wedding anniversary? Date? Seventeen. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah. You knew it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Sometimes so you, we forget, but I, I knew it today. So June seventeenth, nineteen sixty. 61. Oh, 61. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, by my calculations, would be, was that 62 years 62 of marriage? 62 years. Wow. That is, that's a huge accomplishment. <laughs> well, when, yeah, yeah the, the only accomplishment is that you don't get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that's easier you know, said than done. You know, yeah, yeah. And that's, it is worth staying in and, and making things work. Before we get off the subject of marriage, I just because it, you have been married for such a long time, I mean, do you have any any advice on that front because you've had a, such a successful marriage? Well, I think the I think the saying "Don't sweat the small stuff," and everything is small stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it it is it it is accepting and letting things go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think because once you can let it go. There's fine. There's new life. You know, one of the old ones that you hear people say is, uh, "Don't don't go to bed angry or anything like that." Or no, I well, I think that would that would be that's good advice. Uh-huh. That's good advice. I'm not sure that's always happened. Yeah, yeah. But it 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 works out. Well, well you know my wife, so I you, do know her. Yeah. yeah, you know you know that she is the best part of the whole relationship. Is that she is. More, I'll agree with you. She is more patient with me. I'm sure. I'm sure. So, okay. So, um, from there you went on to, uh, uh, to Indiana, right. Indiana University in Bloomington. Right. And how, how many years did you spend there? I spent uh, one year working on the master's degree in the spring of 62, 63, 63, spring of mm-hmm. 63, mm-hmm. Uh, a job opening up opened up at Concordia. A good friend was uh, close to Paul J. Christensen uh, on a lake up here. I think it's Pat Medicine Lake he was on. Oh. And so I was up in Park Rapids uh, visiting him, and he said, oh, let's go over to see Paul J. And so there was an opening at Concordia with the chapel choir because the guy had resigned rather late. And so I was offered a job to teach at Concordia and, and conduct the chapel choir and then do some other things, teach voice. And so spent the year filling that position as an interim. And then Lisa, our daughter, became, we were, she, Pat became pregnant, so we decided to stay on one more year. And I worked in the admissions office. At Concordia. At Concordia. Mm-hmm. And then went back in in 1964. To Indiana. Yeah, into Indiana. Okay. Now, for, for those of you who don't know, Indiana is one of, one of the best music schools in the country. It's yeah. one of the largest. Okay. It's the, in fact, it has so many students that it gets a little bit too big sometimes. <laughs> okay. So was, was it selective back then as it, as it probably would be now? Or how, I mean, how did you come to, 
to ch choose Indiana, or how did well, Indiana it, choose you? For the, for the same reason that you mentioned it, it had a great reputation, mm -hmm. and it was, it was they had a, had a kind of choral conducting program, and so I applied and got in. And how many years did you spend there? But then after after teaching at Concordia, we went back for uh, two more years, and I spent that finishing up the P, uh, PhD courses and got everything done except the dissertation. And then, then, then the opportunity came to move to Evansville, Indiana, uh -huh. and so as we were as I was teaching there, uh, the dissertation was still on my back to get that done. Yeah, and you ultimately finished the dissertation. Yeah, I did finish that six years later. And what was and what was the subject of your dissertation? Oh, it was a music ed kind of a question on when people listen to music, are they, are will they make a choice to go and hear a specific kind of music? Well, then, and I divided it into four different categories, and. It was almost like a kind of like a it, crossover with psychology or well, something. Well, it was it was a I put the student I put the people who were the who were the objects of the study in a room in having a headphone and a dial that could go to four different channels, and to so what I measured how much time they spent on each of the channels. And so as the music changed input into the ears, would they go and find a new channel that they would rather listen to? And one of the fun things that I found from that study was that people with music background were much more open to listen to all kinds of music. That is very interesting. I was gonna I mean, ask you. I was thinking that were. they would be choosing the classical music all the time or going trying to get back to that. No, they were more open to everything. I, I love that because that just that shows one of the benefits, I think, to a, a musical education and, and just music in general is it just makes us more open minded. Right. And so that was basically the, the gist of the study of, the, of finding that particular idea out. And you were able to defend your dissertation? I did. <laughs> was that nerve wracking? Uh, well, it is. It yeah. was. It uh -huh. was. But it was, yeah. Did you uh, did you make some good friends in Indiana too over the years? And yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an interesting thing. The as you move, as we have moved from place to place, the new friends come up, and they are more important than the ones that were there because they're close. They are still in a relationship. And so I forget what happened at Evansville, uh -huh. having been here for 22 years. <laughs> having been here in Park Rapids for right. 22 years, but you've been in Evansville for 30. 30, yeah. Yeah. So and, sometimes, and sometimes former students get in contact, and that's kind of fun. It brings back the memories that you had of them. So tell us about what you did during those 30 years. I taught the music education classes, which means that they're going to go into teaching. They need to go out and they find, find out how do we teach children? How do we teach high school students? And so it was it's kind of the methods classes. Methods, okay. Right. okay. And then I also taught voice, which I was, I, was, I think I was fairly, pretty successful at because I had a good ear. I was able to pinpoint what the problems were vocal problems were and try to devise ways to get them past it are do, you know with with that much experience in in vocal coaching and vocal teaching and things of that nature are do you find sort of common errors that crop up you know across the board like a lot of people do this or a lot of people have this particular issue with their singing that can be fixed or they're too nasal or they're singing with the wrong part of their throat, or what? What are well, some of the common things that really that, the, that trip people up with their singing? The common, the common element I found is posture. How to, how how does the body align? Because if you can get if you can get the posture such that the head is very 
easy on the head, on the on the head, and that the the muscles in the back of the neck are not holding up the body or holding up the head, but it, that the head is free to be there by itself. It can get out of the way. And so it is finding ways to get people out of the way of letting those two little vocal cords do lots of work. You know, and the person who's singing doesn't. Mm-hmm. You know, so it is a matter of then hooking up that intent to sing with the breath and try to free it up so that there are no no muscles getting in the way. Well, and, and it, it that's inevitably going to get uh, complicated when you're doing things like acting at the same time as right. you're singing, right? And so there's there's got to be different techniques. Well, w- yeah, there, ha- getting a technique of singing can be learned, but getting the, te- the technique of communicating takes... Mm-hmm. When a person is in an acting position doing that, if they are in contact with that story that they're trying to say, the body more times than not provides all the impetus that is needed to make that sound. Case in point, a child, a mother that has a child running across the street has no trouble finding the breath support and the projection that is needed to get that information across to that child. Because it's necessary. It's necessary. And so in, in, in speaking, in acting, in, it's, if, you have the, if you have the goal in mind, there's, the body will take enough breath to make sure that you can, can do it. And they will, it will also find the source of energy that comes from deep, deep down inside the body rather than from up in the upper parts of the chest and, and the vocal cords area. It'll be, it will be sound that has a source that is low and has, has meaning. So it's, it is, there, you know, there are techniques that we can also use to help, help them I identify that even more but it's it it basically has to start from the body knowing what it is that you want to say do you think it's easier to teach an actor to sing or a singer to act the trouble with with teaching a singer to uh, an actor to sing is sometimes they haven't developed a tonal memory they have they have you know, a musician has abilities to hear things before they make the sounds, and I think sometimes actors don't have that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, you know, so that comes with time, comes with genes, I think. You know, what, do you, how are, what have you been given? Some people are just naturals, right? Yes, there are some people who have a high, high sense of uh, oral, oral memory. And how do you identify someone, a young singer, let's just say, who has potential um, to be really great, really talented singer? Like, what, what are some of the things that you can see early on that would suggest that to you? Um, um, I think, I think the, the ability to to sing in tune, I think that would be an important thing for me. Is that one of those things that you either you either can do it or you can't? And you, well, can't. you can learn how to get closer all the time, mm-hmm. but it is it's th- that ability to to have internal memory of what the tones are. I think is important because you know people. Some people say, "I just I'd love to sing, but I just can't carry a tune." Right, and you know the other thing is that. There are sometimes body features, high cheekbones. Really? High cheekbones have, I, I, I remember going to a, a store one time as I, I was teaching voice and I, was te- and I saw this girl that had the beautiful high cheekbones and listening to her speak, I thought, oh, you're a singer. Uh-huh. And she said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she had, had a music degree uh-huh. and, yeah, and 
I said, why don't you just come and let me listen, hear you sing uh-huh. if you want. Well, can you ever just tell by, by hearing somebody's speaking voice whether they have the potential to be a good singer if they could carry a tune? Well, possibly. Possibly. Mm-hmm. There are. But it, it is. The beautiful voice is not as important mm-hmm. as the ability to, to make it to tell a story yeah. as you're singing. What what part do you think confidence has to play in that too? Oh, great amount, great yeah. amount, yeah. You gotta have Audacity. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> what, what, what would you say the difference between confidence and audacity is? Well, I, th- I think audacity is, I, I think is, maybe takes, takes a little person a little bit farther. Mm-hmm. Confidence, it might be confidence that's not well founded. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. But anyway, the the whole the whole experience at Evansville. I had a jazz choir. Yeah. Oh, so you tied jazz too. Well, it, okay. only within that choir uh-huh. within that situation. Yeah. Where we and the best the auditioning for that turned out to be, I would play a three-note melody on a piano, and they sang it back. Mm-hmm. Then I would play a four-note melody, and they would sing that one back. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it would get just a little bit more complicated. Would that be like in the do re mi fa sol? Or? Well, yeah, but uh-huh. it would. It would. It would. I wasn't. I didn't go there with that mm-hmm. with tonal, mm-hmm. but it was the people who were able to store that memory of what that melody was long enough so that they could repeat it. Yeah. You know? And it sound that sounds pretty easy, but in practice it's kind of hard because, you know, I, I you know, you have to be able to either remember the dip you know the the different intervals between the notes or That's else it. you just feel it, right? Right. But see that I found to be more indicative of their possible success in singing jazz than the beauty of their tone. Hmm. That's interesting. Is that just peculiar to jazz or? Well, I think it's because jazz, the singing and within jazz, it is, everything is so intricate. It's not, it, the good jazz singers are the ones that the melodies come and they're just like points of, of space, you know, mm-hmm. that they can they can just pick them out. Yeah. And there's more imp- improvisation in jazz. Well, well, yeah, there's more improvisation, you know. And sometimes when they improvise too much, I'd get on them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, what's that called? Uh, is it sc- uh, scat or, or, yeah. or yeah. what is that? Uh, is it Cab Calloway or somebody yeah. was doing that? But anyway, okay. So, uh, Paul, uh, at University of Evansville, I mean, you want to just list off, like, what do you think your your greatest accomplishments were there? Oh, one of the great accomplishments in voice was to have a young lady who was, I think she must have been 350 pounds. Big lady. Yeah. Big. Big person. Yeah, big person. She was piano major. And and all the, all the people who were students at the university have a major instrument and they have a minor instrument. And her minor instrument was voice. Because that was that was what she could do. She sang tenor in the in the college choir. Okay, tenor. Yeah. Uh, right. You know I mean, you, traditionally would, that's a male part. Well, and I found through voice in teaching her that she not only had that low range, she had a range that was to the point where she was doing the Queen of the Night. Wow. Okay. And she spent. After graduation, she auditioned and spent a number of years in singing German opera in, in, in the German opera houses in the in the various cities. Is that right, Wagner and everything? Well, I'm not sure. Did you, well, yeah. maybe. Uh huh. Yeah. But it was you know the, she had she she was she was this voice and that big lady. <laughs> it was a big well, big tone. You have a big, big instrument. Tone, big instrument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem, of course, was that her weight did get into the position where she 
finally died from it. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. But finding that ability to to change, to get her to 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 release. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you was, consider that to be that was a fun, a yeah. good accomplishment, there. right? Okay. And then, what's fun is that University of Evansville has a great theater program. Our daughter Lisa mm-hmm. went. She was a major in music. She had cello as her major, piano, and then took another double major in uh, in theater. Okay. So I got to know the kids in the in the music in the theater department, and so some of those theater students that I had in voice class are now out there professionally singing, uh, pre- performing professionally. Yeah. There's. Um, yeah, so that's kind of fun to see them on stage and see them uh, in uh, in different produ- in I different bet series. Is. And I bet you they remember you too. Well, and, they do. Yeah, yeah, we 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 contact each other on Facebook. Uh huh. <laughs> so, um, but the other, I was saying that at the while things change uh-huh. at at the university, there was. Later on in my tenure there, the university put together a program where all freshmen took a world cultures class. Okay. And so they recruited 25 uh, professors in various fields to be discussion leaders. So I had, as part of my program, leading a discussion (laughs) group of freshmen on world cultures. On world what, cultures. What, what did you know about world cultures? Well, like I had to. I had to keep ahead of them, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things yeah. that's kind of fun about uh, having that challenge. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Is to how do how do we keep ahead of these kids, and how do we find out? They they read prime book, uh, primary books, primary texts. Mm-hmm. They read the Bhagavad Gita. They read the Tao Te Ching. They did okay uh, various things that. Different part, religious texts right, and things like right, that. Various okay. different cultural texts. Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. and so we would have, we would have great discussions. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, it, and didn't didn't you teach abroad too? Well, yeah, yeah, we mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. Well, that started in 1970, which I was new at at Evansville, basically uh-huh. third, third year. Saw an a, an opportunity to do a Fulbright Hayes teaching exchange. Okay, applied for it. Uh huh. And uh, a gentleman from England and I exchanged houses, exchanged cars, <laughs> exchanged jobs. <laughs> what was and, it like exchanging cars with an Englishman? Well, was he, it confusing? Because well, I, I always it, thought it, it was, would be very. And he, he, and he left an, quite an impression on my car. <laughs> Good or bad? I'm assuming <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Did he leave several impressions on the sides and in the? Well, it was basically on the like fr- front end. Okay, but, <laughs> but he was he he. His activity at at Evansville was good because they loved him. Uh huh. And my teaching was at uh, uh, City of Leicester College of Education. Okay, Leicester, England. Leicester, England. Where's that located? I it's know. about seventy miles north of London. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was right up in the Midlands area. Yeah, it was a you know, good train ride. Uh huh. Did you spend much time in London when you were there? Oh yeah, we'd go down. Yeah, take a train down, rather than rather than driving. So, did you go to the theater while you were there too? Yes. What's What's the name of the of the area? I mean, we call it Broadway here, but what do they call it? Over All the there? West End. Ah, oh, that's it. Yeah, West End. Or is it East End? Well, I think it's West End. I think it's the West End. So, did you see a show on the West End when you yeah, were there too? Right. Yeah. Okay. But then we went back another time on a teaching exchange. Actually, this time Pat did the teaching exchange, mm-hmm. and I went as on a sabbatical, which basically said I could be a house husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you do all day in England while your wife is uh, working hard? Well, I did some. I visited some colleges and some tech, you know, some uh-huh. different places to, just to find out what they were doing. But you know, the fun part was uh, we were living in a little co- town called Lytham, which is, it still had in 1985. It still had the green grocer. It had the meat market. Not only the meat market as a building, they had three different 
buildings or different stores that sold different kinds of meat, and mm. they would have other things. So going shopping. Wait, three three different stores. It was selling four or five different stores that you would go to. Different kinds of meat, right? And okay. or different kinds of vegetables, any yeah. kinds of whatever, you know. So, so they what, didn't have a supermarket. They had well, they a did, market. Yeah, they yeah. did have a supermarket that we could have gone to, or I could have gone to, mm-hmm. but I kept saying to the people there, "Don't go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is you're going to lose this." <laughs> You know, did they was, take your advice on that, or was it? have you been back no, recently? I'm, no, no, they did. They they're up. To, I'm sure up to date. Yeah, yeah. You know, those little pop and mom, mom and pop stores are not having that. But anyway, it was it was a great great experience. Okay, so now it's 2000, the year 2000, Y2K, right? Right. And you're saying to Pat, let's hang it up. Let's retire. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, that was 1999, actually. 99. Well, okay. she had retired earlier, mm-hmm. and it it's one of those things that came up and said, okay, it's time. Right. Yeah. Now, um, what is your connection to Park Rapids, Minnesota? I know you, I, I mean, you have a cousin here. I know, right. isn't isn't Eric your, Eric Hoagland your Eric cousin? Eric Hoagland is yeah. my first cousin once removed. His dad and I were first cousins. Oh yeah, that makes it once removed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what was, when's the first time that you came to Park Rapids or what's your connection to the area? Well, in 1976, um, we on a vacation, a summer vacation, we had an idea that maybe we need to look for property up in Minnesota mm-hmm. and have a, a summer home. Both of us teaching, we have our summers free. Yeah. Or, yeah, just about free. And so we stopped by and my cousin showed us around. Eric's father. Yeah, Eric's okay. father. Mm-hmm. And so it was of Thanksgiving of that year that the a, a, a realtor called uh-huh. and said, there's a piece of property I think you should look at. Yeah, uh-huh. And is that the same piece of yeah. property that you own today? Right. And we came up, I <laughs> flew up to take a look at it at Thanksgiving time. Okay, uh-huh. And said, okay, I think this is, I think this will work. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've been to our, I have been to your house. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. It, what it had at the time was a... A small cabin already there, uh-huh. plus about 32 acres with yeah. about a half quarter of a mile on the lakefront. Sure, sure. And this is on Island Lake, Island isn't Lake. it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So we bought it. We started spending summers up here. And so when retirement came about, we decided we'll go up there and figure out where we want to be the rest of our lives. Right. Now, you're coming from... Southern Indiana, right. which I I noticed uh, when I was when I was kind of looking this up earlier, that the average low or something or like the extreme low in uh, Evansville, Indiana, would be like twenty six degrees or something like that, and that would be extremely low. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It, so so then you guys, you and Pat, get together and you say, okay, well, let's move out of this relatively warm climate and go to go to Minnesota and but you, even consider staying there in the dead of winter. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that we both grew up in Minnesota, so we knew what the sub, sub-zero sub temperatures were like. Okay, yeah. You know, so, so it wasn't new to you. It was not. Not <laughs> absolutely new. Okay, so you come up here in, in 2000, and is it your intent to just kind of have a peaceful, quiet retirement and we, that sort of thing? Or what was... Yeah, basically. Okay. You know... Mm-hmm. We thought, okay, let's. We want to. We want to keep this here because it's nice to spend summers up here, but we didn't want it. We were not going to. We weren't going to retire. And have, and, so you've been spending about twenty five summers here, more or less, right. you know, since then. And yeah, right. I'm sure you saw a lot of changes in the area too. Right from that, from seventy right. six until two thousand and everything right. else. So, but it, but it was it was going to be a place that we just to have a, a stopover. But, Until you got to Tahiti or something like that. <laughs> uh, we were thinking Arizona. Uh-huh. There's more of the traditional yeah. retirement places. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, tell us about the idea of how you got uh, started on Northern Light Opera. Northern Light Opera Company, it, it started out as that pun. 
Yep. You know that you, and, yeah, you right. mentioned. Mm-hmm. And it was a little push from Lisa that said, "When are you going to start it?" Mm-hmm. And so we thought, okay, we had friends who were who were interested in music, so we got together and said, "Is there a possibility that we could do summer musicals?" Mm-hmm. You know, and do music theater. And who were some of those people that were that were kind of there from the from the jump? Oh, the lights, Bob and Pat Light mm-hmm. were there. Uh, 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 Dirk Kaising, who was the choir director, um, number of people. Then Pat and and Norm. Uh, Oscar Peterson, mm-hmm. you know these people are no longer around. Yeah, yeah. But so they, where where did you have the first <laughs> the first organizational meeting? Organizational meeting was at Oscar Peterson's house. Okay, and we decided that we could do we could do something next summer that in two thousand and two, <laughs> and so we did uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan trial by, trial by jury, which is a one act opera. Okay, and. Uh, we did the telephone, which uh, Aaron Chenis sang uh-huh. the the lead, and another woman sang the, the part of the of the of the woman. It was it was really successful. Okay. We did it at at uh, at at the Methodist Church, Riverside. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. I was going to ask, like, what were some of the early venues? Okay, for that, that was the that. only early venue. Uh huh. And then when to do it the next year, that by that time Lisa was here. Mm-hmm. For the summer, and she could take over the directing. Was it Lisa part. and Greg at that point, or Lisa just... and Greg? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. They could take over the uh, the. Oh, Greg took over the construction, uh-huh. and Lisa t- took over the acting, and I did the music. Okay, you know, so that was we had our three different areas. So the first show was in two thousand and two, right? And then, of course, we just had the twenty year anniversary. And right. um, and so this was the twenty first production, right? This last year, okay. So, um, I mean, how did it grow in size and scope over the years? Or it was it was interesting because the second the second show we did as the opera company was Pirates of Penzance, another Gilbert and Sullivan, another Gilbert and Sullivan, but big production. We got people in the community to to do, be on stage as the as the policemen, as the pirates, yeah. as, as. How did you know you'd have the the talent that was necessary? We did because some of those. I mean, I mean, I'm just trying to think. Isn't that the one with modern major general right. and all that? And I mean, that's not easy to sing. And no, you know, there's there's it's a Gilbert and Sullivan production. So right. so you say you didn't know. How did you find out? What was the audition process like? Well, I think. It was an interesting thing because we knew people, and we said, "Why don't you?" You do it. <laughs> yeah, basically, we did a lot of that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, I had a church choir at the same time, so there's a number of people in my church. So choir. you knew that you had some people who could sing. Yeah, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. And the person who did the major general was Tom Peterson. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tom yeah, Peterson, uh-huh. uh, our local. Uh, Real estate guy and friend, yes, and friend, <laughs> uh-huh. and to this day, he will break out and sing the, <laughs> the modern right? major. Gen- oh, I'm next time I see him, I'm gonna have to ask oh, him about that. We have wonderful pictures of yeah. of him in costume. We went, we went to at that time rather than uh, creating our own costumes so much, mm-hmm. is we went to Guthrie Theater. They had a costume collection that we could rent from. Oh, I see. Okay. So we well, because I know that now the the company has its own costume shop right. and so forth. But in those early days, they were they were renting from right. the Guthrie. Right. Okay. Oh. And from and then we learned from other places that had costumes as well. But yeah. What were some of the early challenges? I mean, aside from just everything, but like anything that sticks out in your mind. Well, it's. I, I think the early challenges were with with being in the uh, in this high school auditorium, mm-hmm. which was um, was is is not a high auditorium in terms of sound. You know, not a lot of space, and the theater the the stage is not it's wide, but it's not really very tall. 
you know, so some of those things were mm-hmm. uh, lighting was a, a problem, but. And so, how many years were you? Was the was the company in in the high school auditorium? I think we were there for about fourteen years. Okay, okay. So now you're talking. It's 2016, and is that was 2015. 2015, yeah. and that was the shift to the to where it is now, which is right. the the armory. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what what precipitated that that switch? It. I think it was having more possibilities of uh, of having our own control we this this space allows us to be, build bigger sets mm-hmm. taller sets so when we did uh, uh, west side story we had a we had a balcony where the where Maria could come out on. Yeah, and that, <laughs> that was before have, my time. But yeah, I don't. That would not that. Yeah. have been uh-huh. possible at the high school because there's not a high enough ceiling in the sure. in the in the in this on the stage. Well, I just was even thinking of like this year, Little Shop of Horrors. There was a two tier. You know, there was that upper level right. where they they did like the radio interview and things of that nature, and there'd be people up there. And that, yeah, I guess you could, if you think about the ceilings in the high school, that just wouldn't have been it would feasible. Not have been possible. Yeah. So of that, let's say that first. 14 years you know did you yeah uh, obviously I, you did a lot you did 14 shows but did any of them really kind of stick out to you as being particularly memorable or or good or oh. anything of that nature I mean not not to play favorite I mean I know they're all good but well they all had something I I think my favorite show my favorite show I'm trying to think of which one is it going to be what uh, um um uh, into the into the woods. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Or I, th- but we did Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Yeah. Fiddler was 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 That's really a fun. fun. One. Yeah. It was really fun, and it became. It it tied into. People leaving, and are moving away from something comfortable mm-hmm. into the future, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. It, at the end of the production, Lisa, the stage director, broke the rule of the of the of the the wall that sets up between the audience and the actors. She had them come out through the audience exit with their carts, with their as they were moving away from. Yeah, and that must have been a real modern trend or something. Well, like that, that was yeah. well. That was really, that said, oh, they are really going out. Mm -hmm. And Hawkins, I'm not sure, you know Hawkins. Sure. Yeah, he was nine years old, ten years, eight years old, and he was the fiddler on the roof playing his fiddle. (laughs) And so. Yeah. Well, you know, I remember Fiddler, actually, I think Fiddler on the Roof was the first musical that I ever heard because my mom was in that back when we were growing up in Menominee, Wisconsin. They have at the Mabel Tainter Theater, they would put on these productions and she was in that. I I think that might have been either that or West Side Story because I think my grandfather used to have that record and play it with... uh, the original Broadway cast, but it was like Natalie Wood and um, Richard Bamer, okay. uh, you know, things like that. But yeah, so, but um, so you know, we got a comment. I think we got plenty of comments. We were just talking about this last night about about uh, Northern Light Opera Company and just saying that the expectation now is excellence and that it's always a fantastic production. And I guess I was wondering, what do you think makes it such a fantastic production every year? I think it is because the community owns it. I think it has it belongs to Park Rapids. It belongs to the community. We have people who have come forward that have made things happen on stage that are magic. I mean, I I think of uh, Sherry Emerson coming in and doing the painting details to make that that set look like Skid Row, right? I mean, it it is the detail and the, yeah, and the it's dedication. yeah, it's not just we we've been talking mostly about singing and acting and things like that, but it's not certainly not just that, right? No, yeah. no, and, and the 
and the and the, yeah, because, and, and the talent that is here is really quite strong, and I think it. Well, I it's I I think the I think it's the directors. I think it's Lisa who makes them own the part where they are not performing. They are more. They get into who they are. They don't play for laughs. They don't play for emotion because it is the honesty that they can come forward with that really makes it happen. Well, and I mean, that's that's uh, directing, right? I mean, uh, Caleb knows this, but, but what, <laughs> when uh, Caleb was making his movies, I, I would go around in the set and I would say, the foundation of acting is the reality of doing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's really, but I, I didn't say that myself. That was said by a. a, a oh, that's right. You were the stage director. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I was the acting coach. Oh, acting yeah. coach. Sanford Meisner was a was an acting yeah. coach, and I read a book by him, and I just remember that line, and I was going around telling everybody that. But you know, it just reminded me of what you just said, which is to get out of yourself, because you know when you're singing and acting, you know, there's a difference because when you're when you're just acting, you're you're literally just doing what a person might do, but you know, when we're in our day to day lives, we're not just kind of breaking out in song as we, <laughs> I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe in the shower, but, <laughs> yeah. but so there's, so there, it, it takes a special level of, of uh, authenticity to be able to pull off singing and acting at the same time. And I think Lisa does just a great job with, with getting them to, to that point. I think so. And, uh, and Karen, mm -hmm. Oh, the choreographer. The choreography. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, she's successful because she always does some things that are going to be challenging, uh, yet she does not allow them to fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She does not, you know, they're all going to be looking good by the time that they go on stage. Yeah. And yeah. so that confidence that they can have is it's really so important, important, isn't it? You know, I mean, to not, to not try to get somebody to do something that they can't do or right. they're not ready to do. Yeah. Right, and so I think that I think is is really the the strength of both Lisa and Karen. And it's such a polished product. I mean, that's one thing I always seem is that it's just you know there it, the, be, be, between the singing, the dancing, the acting, the set design, and everything like that. There aren't really any any glaring flaws no. to take you to distract you or take you away from it. You know. Well, we've had those moments in our history, <laughs> but we're not going to go there. Yeah, but but those are very few. And Brian Ahart has also been really instrumental, I think, on on getting right. a lot of the technical side. Well, I mean, everybody on the board, Lori Jager, and I mean, just all the, what, the various board members. They all, and it is, they all own it. Mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. There is a, there there is an ownership that people feel that we are the. Mm -hmm. We say family, Enlock family, but it, it it's true. Right, right. So uh, are there any, do you have any, well, first of all, um, I know there's certain kinds of shows that Northern Light Opera would like, say, not perform. Like, I know that sometimes people say, oh, why don't you guys do Phantom of the Opera or something like that? And, and that may be something a little bit too serious or too something, but... You know, but but what what kind? So I guess the question is like, first of all, what kinds of shows are is Northern Light Opera considering doing? Not necessarily names of shows, and then sort of where where wouldn't they go in terms of content? Well, musical theater has a history of doing lots of dance shows, and if it's complete dance show like. Uh, Chorus Ziegfeld line Follies or, right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'd ever go. It has to have a. It has to have a story that's worth telling. Okay. Okay. You know, I think. I don't think that they would be. I think we could do uh, Les Mis. I was going to ask about that one too, but that that one seems quite serious. Oh yeah, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being uh -huh. serious. Okay. Yeah, because in a way, uh, doing. A uh, little shop of horrors mm -hmm. is 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 well, but it's but it's dark comedy. Though. It is really yeah. dark comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, yeah. like in a in a show like Les Mis, I mean, sure there may be some funny moments and everything like that, but I mean, overall, it's more it's a it's a very it's a drama, right? It is, it, 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 and I think that one, I think I think if we could, I think the people would come mm -hmm. if we if they knew about it, and 
if we could get the right personnel, yeah. I think it would be a great show. Yeah, I, I that that the music the, is so memorable. Yeah, but the problem on that one is that we, for many years, we would ask about that, and the, the performing rights were not available. Well, I was going to say too that that must be one of the most expensive uh, shows to to buy the the royalties because right. can you just explain a little bit about how that works? I mean, you can't just say you can't just announce, oh, I'm going to do. Uh, uh, you know, West Side Story or something like that. Well, maybe that one's out of copy, you know, but let's just say a more modern production like The Lion King, you know, we're going to go do Elton John's The Lion King. Well, you can't just do that, right? I mean, so you have to you have to uh, go through some well, some business. Yeah, there are different different companies have the hold the rights for performance. And the last show that we did was Music Theater International. Mm -hmm. And so... <clears throat> Before you make a decision on which show you want to do, you have to make you have to do an inquiry to find out if those rights are available. Okay. Sometimes they're not available because they're they're planning a revival, mm -hmm. or they're planning road trips. You know, so yeah, sure, the touring show and right. stuff like that. So yeah, so that. But otherwise, other than that, once you figure out what it is you want to do and. Mm -hmm. You could go and find the rights. I mean, just out of curiosity, like, what's the going rate to, to do a show in terms of royalties? For for our particular stage and number of seats that we have, uh -huh. it's a little over seven thousand. Okay, all right. So it's I mean, it's it's you know, it's not a small sum, but it's also not too large. Well, it it's it's we can work it into the budget, and then that's an, another thing about uh, we have. We have a we have a pretty good we have a strong budget I think <laughs> I can't imagine well, uh, yeah because we have good financial leadership <laughs> well it, but it's one of those it's one of those things that the people who have been to the shows have been really very lovely about giving us funds mm -hmm. because they believe in what we're doing we have people who have will give us fifty dollars, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, a thousand, and I, it just blows my mind. Yeah, and we also have a very good grant writer too. I hear. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul. So, um, are there? Do you have any sort of favorite musicals that that we haven't done yet that you'd like to see done in the future? I know you mentioned Les Mis, but any others? No, I, I, I I'm. I'm leaving that up to to Lisa mm -hmm. and Greg and Karen or whomever is in that process. The of, powers that be. Yeah, yeah, the powers that be. <laughs> okay. And that's one of the things that I'm very, very, very thankful for is that after 22 years here, I believe that the structure, the people are set for things to be moving on. Into the next generation. Into the next generation. That's a good feeling. It is, because that's not always been there, thinking that the board had that as a problem one time, is that I had an accident where I fell on the ice and was had a concussion. I went out and they said, what would happen if you did? Where would we go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just sort of dawned on them that, Gee, Paul may not live forever. <laughs> That's right. And, no, uh, and, and I think, I don't think Paul is going to live forever. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> well, in one way or another. Right. But it's, um, but so I, I'm feeling very confident that things are in a good spot. Yeah. That's a, that must bring a good feeling of peace to you. Well, it is. It is also uh, kind of, they can get along without me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, uh, before, I just have a few more uh, things to ask you about, but I wanted to get kind of it, because I noticed that you had a degree in philosophy and then you also have a music degree. So I thought I'd, maybe I'd ask you just a few questions about the philosophy of music. Okay. Okay. So, well, first of all, what is the definition of music? Definition of music? I think it's I think it is that which cannot just be spoken. It is it has it has messages that come across that are not able to be to be literal. 
you know, mm -hmm. it, it, words are not adequate. And you find people making music, uh, and it becomes, I think it becomes closer to a religious experience than not. Hmm. Very interesting. I mean, I think it has that power to be, to set us in relationship to something that's bigger. Because as far as I know, uh, humankind is the only species that has music. Or, or do you not find that to be I'm, true? I'm, I'm not sure. I think birds sing pretty well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. What, what makes a particular piece of music worth listening to? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think, I think, the whole idea of does it grab you? Does it make you consider? Can does it keep you listening? You know, sometimes music exists as background to take your your mind or your your feelings away from what's happening. Elevator music, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that that is successful only in that it becomes an acoustical thing that sets you at ease. Da -da. It has a different purpose, you know. But I think. For, for music and the arts to exist, I think we have to be honing our senses of perception and hear things that are there that may not be obvious or first time around, so the second time around, oh, you, you start hearing things that are working. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, think it's, I think the arts are there to educate the senses so that we become better listeners, we become better seers, we become better movers, we become whatever it is that that art is is trying to tell you. What's what is the connection between music and emotions? Well, I think I think it can be anytime you get outside of yourself. It has an opportunity to be very an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a Mahler symphony. It's it is it takes you and it transports you in certain ways that. In it, it doesn't take you into, into a reverie necessarily. I think it has. If once it goes into reverie and you lose track of what the sound is, you're just in a memory. I think it's the It's that the music continues to be there and you are hearing it and there's a certain amount of well i also think that a crescendo in music mm -hmm. has a body which is a slow building of yeah. of, of yeah. volume i think and yeah and sound. i think there mm -hmm. is a certain type of emotion that comes up when that sets the body moving in the same sort of feeling or vicariously moving in that same way, and a decrescendo would have the opposite right. effect. Yeah, yeah. It is. It. This is, this takes me back. When I was on a teaching exchange, I got a chance to work with somebody who was a specialist in movement education, and she her basic training was in Laban, and uh, uh, notating of what movements were doing. And it was at that time that I thought, if you can get children to experience and respond to quickness in music, their next time they hear music, they can they can take that what they're hearing and internalize it because they've already experienced it. Mm -hmm. hmm. So a movement and music. For me, at that time, was a this. There's a lot of connection here. Yeah, yeah. It's there's something fundamental, I think, about music. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are some things that you're currently listening to, music-wise? I'm not. I don't. Mm hmm. I don't. That's that's sad. That is sad. <laughs> yeah. 
Because Maybe that'll change it, yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. My hearing is at a point where I get a lot of static. Oh, I see. Yeah. I go to a concert at the at 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 the armory and it mm-hmm. it doesn't fit. Yeah. It's it's harder to hear music. Yeah. Yeah. Um so touching on Park Rapids, you mentioned that you come here in 1976. What do you like about the Park Rapids area? Oh. I think it's well, I think it's the people. Mm-hmm. I think it has possibilities. What feeling does it inspire in you? Just the the, the landscape, the weather, the geography, uh, things like that. Well, that you know, it there's a certain amount of when we when we walk in the morning in our driveway and it's filled with trees and it's filled with birds, it's filled with all you know, I think there's I'm going to get religious and say that it is I do find that that there is a God moment in that walk. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that's we find that here. But I think it could be found anywhere. I don't think it's peculiar to Park Rapids, but right. I think Yeah. Here you here it's it's especially it's not, you, know, you know, looking out over the lake. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the wonder of creation. Yeah. Yeah. Um Paul, what advice would you give to young people? Caleb. Okay. <laughs> what advice? Not necessarily Caleb, but okay. any young person. Well, I would say uh, keep your mind open and be honest. Be honest with what your feelings are because not everybody has to be an opera singer or the top person. It, there are there's there's absolutely room for everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think, but d- don't lose the idea of of having a vision of what you want to do. But find find those people who are going to help you with that vision and be very open and very, you know. Don't don't have don't have a complete feeling that you know it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know that there is there are things to learn. You know, then I think that'll take I think that'll take a person a long ways. Do you have a favorite hymn or spiritual song? Dear, uh, oh, they're all good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're all good. I, you know, yeah, they're all good. They're all good. That's a good answer. Yeah. Okay, um, and then the last question is. What do you do in the winter time in Park Rapids? Oh, we come to town every day. I'm sure we are. We are committed out of <laughs> <laughs> working with the Northern Light Opera Company, working with the Armory uh, Armory Arts and Events Center Board, working with the uh, we the Arts Council. We have. We have our finger. I have my fingers in so many things, mm-hmm. you know. So it's there. There are no down moments. Staying busy. Staying is busy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, Paul, it's. Uh, I have to say that it's just uh, such a pleasure to be your friend and and to to have you as a guest here on our our podcast. We've had a very interesting discussion, and I hope that maybe someday you'll come back and talk to us some more. Well, I'm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, Paul Dove.